He's been the shop manager at the West Branch Angler and Resort for the last 19 years. Um, he um, has a degree in biology and he's um, from Northeast Ohio and um, wanted to get more into the trout fishing. As, as you know, there's not much trout fishing in, in Ohio and he came up to the Northeast and uh, never looked back. Um, like I said, he's got 19 years in the area and on the river. He's got a lot of experience and knowledge on fishing the Delaware. He, uh, he primarily fishes dry flies and streamers. Um, and and uh, I think maybe some of you guys may know him if you, if you went down there uh, on some trips in the last 15, 19 years. I know there were a group of guys that went every year and I think they went right to the West Bank Angler. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to Ben and um, we'll sit back and listen to your presentation, Ben. Thank you. And before Ben starts, I'm just gonna say one more time that um, we are recording. About 10 more people have joined since we made the initial announcement. So just letting everybody know that we are recording tonight. So again, sorry for the interruption and, and take it away, Ben. Yeah, so my name is Ben Sheard. I work at West Branch Angler. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. I've got a presentation. It's titled Tips, of, Tips for Effectiveness on the Delaware River System. Um, I know a lot of you guys are familiar with the Delaware. Some may have not been here. It looks to be another great year. We've got a great snowpack. Seems like it's snowed every day for the last two or three months. So we've got a good foot and a half on the ground, probably two feet in the mountains. So it should be a good year. The presentation is pretty diverse. It's got a lot of general information that's going to be kind of geared towards the Delaware, but it's going to be relevant to any trout stream in the Northeast. A lot of the tips and tactics would be relevant to anywhere where you're trout fishing. Um, again, I do, I fish a lot. I've lived here for almost 20 years, year round on the banks of the Delaware River. Um, I prefer to dry fly fish. I'll do what I have to. Um, I do streamer fish a lot. I don't nymph fish a ton. I do if I really need to, but the one beauty of the Delaware system being a tailwater, we have some really good hatches, especially for the Northeast. Um, from mid-April till say late October, probably later, depending on the weather, you can probably find some fish rising if that's what you wanna do. So there are also a few stopping points in here where I'll stop and we can address any questions. Um, and I encourage that a lot of good conversation comes from these questions. So I'll go ahead and get started here. Let's see. I don't know. Let's see, I'm just having trouble changing the slides. I'm not, I've never done this on Zoom before, but let's see. Okay, let's see. I don't know why. I was doing it Are with they... you earlier before everyone logged <laughs> on. Are you, um, are you in the presentation mode or? Yeah, I'm just screen sharing. Let me, I'm just gonna hit escape here and see. It seemed to work. Sorry about the delay there, guys. Um, this is just an aerial view of our resort here. It's West Branch Angler. We're about a half hour east of Binghamton, New York, right off of Route 17. This is our 30th year of business. We started in 1991 and have built a little bit. But as you can see, there are probably 25 of our 30 cabins. The building at the top of the cabins there, that's our fly shop. And to the left of it, about nine o'clock, you can see a small building behind the trees there. Those are, or that's where our restaurant, our bar and restaurant is located. So it's a really cool place. We have cabins from one bedroom cabins up to three bedroom cabins, several uh, different versions of one bedroom cabins, two bedroom cabins. So 
really to accommodate any party size, whether it's you or a fishing buddy. We also have a lodge that's like a bed and breakfast where rooms start at under 80 bucks a night for one guy. Um, you get free breakfast at the restaurant with your stay. And we do own about 1.5 miles along the river, both sides. So drift boats can float through. So you will have other fishermen fishing, but it really does give us some private access. If you have fished the Delaware, you know it can be very crowded. Last year was even more crowded with the COVID. We saw like all outdoor industries, a huge surge in just people looking to get away. A lot of new fly fishermen, which is great for the sport, um, but it can be crowded. So it is a benefit to have a little bit of private water there. And we're about five miles south of the dam. I'll show you on a map here. These are some of our Grandview cabins, just a great cabin for two or three guys or gals. Um, there's a charcoal grill and a fire pit right off the deck there. That's one of our bigger CEO cabins. Again, you've got the deck out front and the river's about 30 feet away from the deck. So this is a map of the general area. Where it cuts off on your left-hand side is probably about where Binghamton would be, where 81 South comes down. One thing, if you're familiar with the area, which most are, you know, as you get into that lighter tan color, you really start to get more elevation and you're in the foothill of the Catskills. About where the east branch of the Delaware is there, that's where you the, the real line is for the designated Catskills. So if you look at the two rivers, we're right where the trout is. So we're right on the border of the northeast corner of Pennsylvania. Directly north of us, you'll see Cannonsville res Reservoir. To the east of us, you'll see Papacton Reservoir. So we're on the West Branch there. You tend to read and hear more about the West Branch. And the main reason is the West Branch is a lot shorter. If you look at the whole river, even above the reservoir system, you'll notice they put the reservoir on the West Branch much lower to the confluence to the East Branch where it makes up the main stem. Whereas the East Branch, the tailwater portion is probably 30 miles long versus the West Branch from the dam to confluence, you're looking at about 12 miles long. One thing also on that Western side, like I said, you're kind of just getting into the Catskills above Cannonsville Reservoir that feeds the West Branch. It's a lot of farmland. So there's more of a silt problem within the Cannonsville Reservoir as opposed to Papacton. What that means for us fishing, we get much better releases out of the Delaware, for the Delaware system. We get by far the best because it's the least quality drinking water for New York City. The main purpose of Cannonsville is to push that salt line back in Delaware Bay down in the ocean so the water does not encroach up, destroy water systems, et cetera. And that's one thing they really don't mess around with. So it could be very dry, especially later in the summer. Dry, drought-like conditions typically mean higher water, better releases, and it's always cold water. So we have better releases, and with that, years and decades of those better releases and consistent releases, your bug life is a lot more prolific than say the East Branch. The East Branch does have a few bugs that we don't have just due to substrate, but overall we just get much better releases. So say a sulfur hatch, which happens in the summertime when ambient temps are a little warmer, you're not gonna get nearly as prolific as sulfurs on the East Branch as you do on the West, because when they come, it's usually warm, almost too warm to fish on most years by late June, early July, then it will pick back up in the summer. So the one beauty of what we do here, and again, the presentations on the Delaware system, not just the West Branch, between the West Branch, East Branch, and then the trout populated portions of the main stem, in the early season and late season, when the ambient temps are conducive to it, we're fishing 80 miles of river within the Delaware system. If you look east of where it's labeled East Branch of the Delaware, you'll see the Beaver Kill and Willow Muck, very famous rivers for a century plus, you know, Lee Wolf, Theodore Gordon, all those famous Catskill guys, they were fishing the Beaver Kill and Willow Muck. They're tributaries of the East Branch. One more thing before I leave this picture, to remember, if you're fishing and get a big rainstorm, the beaver kill, the willowy mock, 
the East Branch, all that land, it's a huge drainage compared to what we're dealing with over here. Because unless like north of us, we only have five miles of river and tributaries for it to get muddied up and get turbid. Whereas the Beaver Kill, Willow and Mock, you probably got a hundred miles there plus that it's draining. So the same rainfall that hits us on the West if it hits east over there, the exact same rainfall, it's gonna be exponential on the east branch. So that's just something to remember if you're up here fishing. One thing also, if one of the rivers does get blown out, it's an easy drive if you're willing to go explore, to go hit a section, you might hit the upper east branch above the beaver kill and willow we mock. Um, again, you just have less tributaries. These are just a few little kind of factoids, um, some new stuff. As you know, you guys are probably dealing with it as well. I don't know how many of your fisheries are directly impacted by it, but there are some new regulations that are probably, I don't know the exact date when they're gonna go in. I know the public comment session just ended a couple weeks ago at the end of January, but for the new regulations, as far as the Delaware system, um, the, the one of the positive things as far as killing fish, which does happen on the Delaware system a lot more than we'd like to see, but you know, for the last several decades, maybe longer, I've only been here a couple decades, but you can kill five fish. So you could kill two fish on the West Branch, two on the East, and one on the main stem. That's five wild fish per day that do get taken. And uh, in all honesty, it has affected the river system, especially over the last decade. But what it's going to now is just one fish total, which makes a lot of sense because basically our river system, the Delaware here, you're dealing with Pennsylvania, New York State, then you got New York City. This isn't even dealing with the, you know, the water flows. This, these are just regulations, so they kind of all have to agree upon it. But they did a big study. They hadn't studied it in two or three decades and very, very little efforts gone into, you know, fish counts, red counts, et cetera, the typical fish bio stuff that would take place. But with this joint fishery study between New York and PA, which took place the last couple of years, they got a lot of data. They put pit tags, small radio telemetry tags in between the um, peck fins of fish to kind of see how they move. Because on the, de the main Delaware, where you can only kill one fish a day, because there are a lot less fish, when that ambient temp warms up, which leads to the water temp warming up, those same fish that are protected down there more so than the east and west move up into the east or west, primarily the west, for thermal refuge. And then now you can kill two of those fish that you could only kill one of if they you know, were a mile down river. So it didn't make a lot of sense. So hopefully this will help. The one thing that's probably gonna be a negative um, it is what it is. It's probably going to go forth, you know, from right where our resort is, about a half mile below, a half mile from where I sit now, you have the Pennsylvania border on River Right. For decades, 30 plus years, that's always been closed starting, it used to be October 1, about five years ago or 10 years ago, they changed it to October 15th. But from October 1, or October 15th to April 1, it was closed down for the spawning fish, um, which really helped them. As you know, that deposit area up where it was closed probably gets hit more than any section of river. Long story short, it's not particular to the Delaware, but any fishery that was closed in the winter for that reason is now going to be open with these new regulations. They claim from all the meetings that we've gone to, there's no data that supports catching fish on reds and fishing to them while they're spawning has any mortality rate, which is basically untrue. No matter how ethical you are, how, you know, barbless hooks, et cetera, getting fish in quick, there's always a mortality rate to catching fish, handling fish, especially if it's cold and freezing. So it is what it is, but they plan to keep the upper West Branch open starting, um, 2021. So October 15th, it will not close down. They plan to keep that open. We'll just have to see what they rule on that. One thing also, uh, the Delaware itself is the longest undammed river of the east of the Mississippi. 
It's 152 miles total, 73 and a half roughly are ruled by National Park Service. It's also a wild and scenic river. And overall out of the whole country, less than one quarter of 1% of all the rivers in the US are wild and scenic. And the fact that it's 150 miles from New York City and the major metros of the Northeast, that's pretty impressive. So it's a, it's a pretty cool river system, um, especially the size of it, the wild fish. There's a lot that goes into that. So we're lucky to have that in our backyards. One thing also, we could have a five hour presentation just on the water flows. The more you fish it, the more you'll get into it. I'm sure you hear about that. It is very predictable if you talk to someone that knows what's going on. On the other hand, it's very complicated. There's an FFMP, stands for Flexible Flow Management Plan. It used to expire every year, every couple of years. I think in 2018, the powers to be passed one that went for 10 years, which is good. And the thing is, you've got five, the five decree parties, which all have to agree upon any decision that's made. And there were also some steps forward in that where all five don't have to come in if say they need a thermal release. It used to have to be all five decree parties. So you have New York State, New York City, Delaware, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. They all have to agree upon that. Back before they passed that last one, if one of those decree party members were on vacation, nothing happened. Or if there was a political beef and they didn't want to cooperate with New York City or New Jersey and Delaware were fighting for what reason, they could do stuff that affected our river. Now that it's gone away a little bit, and actually for like thermal releases, say the water gets hot and we need a little extra drink or a little extra cold water to keep the water cool, like one biologist can make that call and it's accepted. But Again, a lot of people have stake in what the water that comes out of the Delaware. It's 15 million people's drinking water in the U.S. That's 5% of the nation's population. Okay, I'll go into this real quick. And these are just a few pointers that really will help you fishing the Delaware. Some are going to be super obvious, like the first one, not being able to cast. The one thing, it's a very big river. Um, a lot of times the fish are not near a bank. They're not near a rock, not near a blowdown. They're seemingly out in the middle of the river. And that's, I know I was, uh, it was a little difficult for me. It's difficult for everybody when you first start out because I grew up fishing smaller streams. Every fish was 10 or 15 feet off the bank or five feet off the bank. Um, out here it's big water and you have to be able to cast. If you're playing golf at Augusta and you can't hit a golf ball, you're going to have a tough time. So practice, that really does help a ton. Um, the second one, not being able to reach cast and mend, doing a reach cast, a reach mend. Long story short, we're always setting up uh, upstream from the fish, casting down. So a reach cast is your lines getting aerialized out of your guides, going through the air. You're going to reach the rod up river. Whereas a reach mend, you wait until that line hits the water, and then you can do that reach upriver. Basically, it's going to buy you five or 10 more feet of a drag free drift. Because again, if you guys have fished here, even the small fish, the 10 inch fish, if your fly is dragging, they are not going to eat it. And again, one thing to throw in there we're typically casting downstream to fish. That's probably one of the biggest mistakes you see people make. Occasionally, if the conditions are right, you can cast upstream to a fish. What we do, whether you're in a boat floating or you're on foot, you have to make the approach, get well above them, and then you're going to present the fly to them first. So they're seeing fly first and a leader. Number three, just unreal expectations. It's a world-class fishery. A lot of people expect a lot out of it. But uh, money will get you a nice cab and get you on the river, but it won't buy the skill. That practice is essential. It's a technical river. Can you nymph up some fish or swing some wet flies where a dragging fly will work? Nymphing, not so much, but a lot of times for beginners, I recommend swinging wet flies. It's the only type of fishing you're going to do here 
where a drag free drift or is not required. You know, you're essentially letting it swing. It's tight line. You can get away with heavier tippet. So if you have kids or a wife or somebody that's just getting into fishing, maybe a buddy that wants to try it out, wet flies are a great, great way to get fish. If you don't have that skill to lay out an accurate cast. Eaters for dries. Another very common mistake, a lot of people just don't need that on their local fishery. You're gonna to wanna to run a 10 foot or greater leader. Most of the time, especially later in the season, you're talking to guides. Um, if you're out with a guide, they're probably gonna set you up with a 12 to 14 foot leader. A lot of times guys that are used to fishing up here, they might be running 14 to 16 foot leaders. At the end of the day, it keeps your fly far, or your fly line farther away from the fly, which is gonna spook the fish. Fly line spook fish. Um, one thing too, say you make a cast, you don't always want, a lot of guys are intimidated by that longer leader, which they have not used. If you haven't practiced with a 14, 15 foot leader and a small fly, the wind is really gonna move your fly around. So punching the leader, that's a great skill to learn. The one thing to remember again, we're above the fish casting down to them. So if my fly lands five feet away from the tip of my fly line, no big deal. Great time to do a reach man, and I can pull a lot of that slack out. So I'm throwing a 14 foot leader, my fly's five foot away from the tip of my fly line, great time to pull out about seven or eight foot of that leader that's not where you want it to be and put it in the right place. Um, number five, too long or light of a leader for streamers. I won't streamer fish with less than 10 pound tippet. Um, typically I'll use an old ratted up leader, cut it back so it's pretty hefty and then attach some 10, maybe even in heavier water, 12 pound test. You're gonna lose less flies, especially in heavy current, you're fishing from a boat maybe. You really wanna, you know, you catch a 24 inch fish in, 3,000 CFS of water, they turn sideways. You really need to put some uh, rod cork to them and that, that heavy leader does help. So typically not any longer than five feet. As you well know, the longer your leader is with any type of weighted fly, it's gonna be bad, but keep it short. The fish won't mind. Um, a lot of times if you're streamer fishing, water might be turbid, et cetera. Another one, number six, Casting too much, not paying attention to the rhythm of feeding fish. That's a big problem. Even some of my buddies and guides, and I'm prone to do it as well. We're out there, you stock up on a fish like a uh, great blue heron, and you're watching his rhythm. Every fish has a rhythm. Time spent just watching the river, watching the fish will pay you in the end. I promise you that. Um, say I go out there and I make one cast, just one cast no matter how good it is or how bad it is, and that fish changes his rhythm, if he starts feeding more, that's awesome. That's not typically what I'm talking about. Typically, they're gonna stop altogether. Maybe instead of feeding five times a minute, they're feeding twice a minute or once a minute. If he changes his rhythm, step back, watch the river, and it's gonna help you a ton. One thing too, as far as their rhythm, as far as the rhythm of those fish feeding, a lot of times, say a prolific hatch like our sulfur hatch, you got a ton of bugs and that fish is feeding five times a minute like a sewing machine, you know, once every 10, 12 seconds, he's feeding like a sewing machine. If he just ate, try not to land your fly there because you need to wait another 11 seconds. I can't stress how important that is to get in that rhythm. Um, number seven, not getting a dead drift. That kind of goes along with reach cast, reach mend. You got to achieve a dead drift if you're fishing on top or nymphing. Another one is wasting time on non-catchable fish or situations that are really not conducive to that. I think of flat frog water. You might see the biggest fish of your life right at the witching hour when there are spinners, there are fish rising everywhere, and you see a big fish and he's just in some super slow frog water it's pretty much impossible to get a good drift. Unfortunately, you probably should go and find another fish. That's where faster water is a plus. These super difficult fish, 
that take hours to catch sometimes, which is fun. That's what we do. I love spending time on fish. But a lot of times, if you're looking to catch some fish and put some numbers in the boat, um, look for that faster water, look for that fish feeding a little more steadily. We're all prone to do it. I've wasted a good portion of my life fishing to fish that I couldn't catch, I didn't catch. So it's kind of one thing you do learn from experience. Another thing, um, just not putting pressure on fish after the hooks, the hook set. Again, these are all wild fish and you're fishing out there and you finally get the fish of a lifetime, say a 24 inch brown on 6X tippet, you really need to put some cork to him because the longer that fish is fighting in the water, the more bad things can happen. I always tell people at a presentation, one thing that I'll do and it surprises you if you haven't done it. When you're fighting, I don't care what kind of fish it is, unless you're trying to get above coral with a bonefish or something, you wanna point the butt section of the rod towards the fish. That's gonna make your rod act as a shock absorber. So if I have the butt facing the fish and start to move the rod tip towards the fish, every degree I'm pointing that rod tip towards the fish, I'm losing that shock absorption that rod provides. But what I tell people, take your nine foot five weight or four weight, get about 20 foot away from a fence post or a doorknob, tie a couple good knots, tie your 6X tippet to that doorknob, point the butt section of rod at that doorknob, you'll be amazed at how much pressure you can put on those fish. Again, it's just a learning thing, but you really can put a lot of pressure on fish I rarely go below uh, 6X. I might use 7X once every two or three years. Dry fly fishing, I start out with five. Once it gets a little later in the season, I'll proceed to 6X. Um, number 10, using the wrong fly, usually fooled by the number of bugs. And again, that's something that comes with experience. A good example is, um, say you're out there fishing early May and you see some beautiful, nice, number 14 Hendrickson's floating down and you're not really watching the water paying attention. Maybe the fish randomly grabs a Hendrickson in front of you and you just assume he's eating Hendrickson's um, because they're big, they're on the water. But say that same day there, there've been paralepsis for weeks and those fish just like all predator species, they get imprinted on what they see. So there may be less blue quills, paralepsis, than there are Hendrickson's. Hendrickson's are much bigger. There are more of them. You're talking about a 14 Hendrickson versus an 18 blue quill, and they're randomly picking off the blue quills because they've been imprinted on them. They've seen them. Um, so it's just important, again, sitting back, watching those fish. They'll teach you all you need to know if you're patient. And again, pay attention to water flows. I hate seeing people come down and they're surprised by Oh, they released water. Um, it's mainly due to release. Everybody can look at the radar and see if a rainstorm's coming in. But, um, you know, I'm in the shop at least five to six days a week. We're there to help you out. If you're going to calm down and you're just wondering, please give us a call. Our contact info is at the end of the presentation. That's what we're here for. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I just want you to have a good time because a good example, say the reservoirs at 97% in the beginning of May, and you're going to come in. Water flows are perfect, 500 CFS. And they got some rain in Walton above the reservoir. We know that there's a bubble that's working its way over the reservoir. It might take a day or two. And once the water starts spilling at that time of the year, according to that flow plan, like I talked about, they're going to release 1500 CFS. So long story short, if you're ever in doubt, please give us a call. We'll be happy to give you our best knowledge of what's gonna happen. Alrighty, this is probably, especially when we go to boots on the ground shows, Somerset, some of the fly fishing shows, which we do in a normal year, the most common question I get asked are when should I come? Um, it's a tough question to answer because I like fishing a lot of times of the year, and to be honest, like May, you can see right in the middle, May's prime time. I'm not a big fan of May versus July. You're going to have a lot of bugs and probably 10% of the people. But this is pretty true. I would say 95 out of 100 years or, you know, unless you have an El Nino winter, this is going to be pretty correct within 
a week or so, depending on ambient temps. So April 1 to the 15th, um, it's a gamble. You're really gambling on high water weather. You're gambling with the weather. I would say between that time period, you probably got a 60% chance of coming up, having cold air temps, runoff, maybe snow. It's not going to be that. Bugs are cold-blooded creatures, and they're not going to hatch if it's 41 degrees and windy. Um, you're gambling. The good, the winning side of that gamble, if you hit it right, you guys are pretty close. You see a time in there, the bugs have started. You get a 65, 70-degree day. You can come down and have some of the best fishing of your life because those fish have not been fished to. They haven't been molested. They're going to take a nicely presented fly. Usually when you get into... April 15th of the 30th, the stability starts. That actually coincides with when we start to see good bug hatches also. Any mayfly you see now till say mid-April, it's gonna be a betus, a blue winged olive. And that's not super common till we get some warmer weather. It isn't the best winter fishery, especially for bugs and stuff. Um, we will get some stone flies before that. I got a lot on bugs here coming up, but um, you're not going to see paralaps, which are, you got quill gordons and paralaps, paralaps or blue quills, which are going to start usually around second week of April there. So the 15th of the 30th, the stability starts that just coincides with nicer, warmer ambient temps, probably a little less rain, the snow that we have on the ground, it's not going to be gone for a while. May, the whole month of May, aside from a rainstorm, I have it prime time. You got a lot of good hatches. You know, we could go through, you got blue quills. Again, I'll go through all these bugs here in a second. Um, but that's when most people come. On the other side of that, that's when the most people come. So like I said, you're fishing the sulfur hatch in July or you fish that. If you come in May, you're probably going to see 10 to 15 times the amount of people then. So it's fun, but you do have a lot of people. Late May, early June, you got your bigger bugs. You're talking green drakes, brown drakes, um, some other hatches starting. Just depends on the air temp. Um, and then mid-June to August, probably more like late June to August, I have bug soup. That's when we get into our sulfur season. Several different types of sulfurs, which I'll go over in a minute, but small little Dorotheas. They start eight size 18 and 20. It's pretty specific to the deposit area. Starts around 11 to noon. You can set your watch by it. Goes most of the day. Probably peters out six, seven o'clock. May have some spinners later. Very predictable. And the fish are, they get tough. It's maddening. They see so many of these bugs. There's some idiosyncrasies with how the bugs hatch, which make it more difficult. Um, but it's a good time to come. July, I love July. It's one of my favorite times to fish. The sulfur hatch is probably the most bugs you'll see in the Northeast. Um, once we get into late summer, early fall, September, October, one thing to keep in mind, it happens nine out of 10 years, probably more often than that. A lot of it depends on how much water they've been releasing, but we have turbid water. The water's gonna get pretty dirty. It's not gonna be a gin clear trout stream. Those fish can still see the bugs, feed on the bugs but it's going to be dirty water if you like streamer fishing um it's a good time to come long story short what what happens you're familiar with a lake any kind of still water you've got thermoclines being that they suck all the water off the bottom especially on the west branch there this isn't a problem you see on the east branch because they don't suck all all the water like they do on the west it messes with those thermoclines and the reservoir turns over earlier you know, as water is colder, it's more dense. So you have those thermoclines of density and colder water, it's by water temp. Once the water temp and the density is the same, the silt off the bottom of the reservoir is gonna migrate up and even the spill can be dirty, but that's one thing too. Then I have at the bottom, don't get burned by random chance. The reason I say that, I deal with it probably on a daily basis or weekly basis, someone comes maybe it's their second time coming this year they came last year may 12th because they wanted to hit the hendrickson hatch which they're usually there they're almost always there but they came last year and a storm came 
that's just random chance. Don't get burned by that. Talk to guides, guys at fly shops, your friend that's fished here. And, uh, you know, th like I said, this is going to be pretty true, but you can always run into a crummy. Trust me, there are piss poor days to fish in May. And there are awesome days to fish in set August or September. A lot of it, most of it depends on the weather, especially sunshine. Fish don't have eyelids. Sunshine is typically not that good compared to a nice cloudy day. Okay, we'll get into the bugs a little bit. I can pause a second. Any questions on what I covered so far? Yeah, Ben, uh, we did get a bunch of questions that came in, so I'll just go through them real quick. Uh, yep. Let me pull up the chat here because I kind of moved it out of the way of my screen so I could see the presentation. So there was an early question about, do you drift boat or wade in the West Branch in the spring? I know uh, another person had responded to that saying, drift, what's your, your take on drift boat versus wade in the West Branch in the spring? Yeah, so it's a pretty quick answer. Um, if you're coming up on your own, obviously, you're going to want to watch the water, especially this year. Going to be a lot of runoff. That reservoir will start spilling probably sooner than later. It's at like 82% now, but you get a few days of warm rain that could change quickly. So you want to watch it. Early season is not the best for wade fishing. It can happen give us a call, watch your water flows, read the fishing report, which I type every day. Um, on the other hand, if you're going out with our guides or any guide in the area for that matter, they're gonna go on a drift boat. Yes, you can get, if it's conducive to it, you can get out, hop out, wade, hit a run, but you're gonna be in a drift boat. A lot of times I get people that wanna do a walk wade trip, maybe to learn the river, you're really pigeonholing yourself into a lesser experience versus floating five to seven miles a river, exploring a lot that's probably not real easy to get from the public access points and fishing from a boat versus wade fishing. There are so many benefits to it. I won't go into it, but you're kind of standing on top of the water, if that makes sense. You're in a boat. So like mending, managing fly line, fighting fish, it's a huge advantage to be in a boat in any guide trip, they're going to run out of boats and wait if they can. Okay, great. Oh, thank you. Okay, a few more. Um, the uh, West Branch and East Branches, is the access more private or public? I know you kind of addressed a little bit of that by saying, you know, the, the, the drift obviously would, would um, you know, get around that issue. But uh, West and East Branches, is the access more private or public that you find down there? The West is going to have more public access both from, you know, standards throughout this country, both are pretty accessible. Um, the West does have more access, actually quite a bit. I could point you into more access points on the West Branch than you could fish in a weekend. And, and once you get in the river, you can go wherever you want without going into a long conversation. There are some issues on the East Branch where if you're walking in the river, some people claim that they own the bottom of the river. And then it goes into deeded stuff and legality. But long story short, both very accessible. The West has more public access. Okay. Um, another one was uh, any spay casting from the shore? Sure, yeah, definitely. Especially I would say for a strong wader, if you're comfortable wading, even up to 1500 CFS, a spay rod is an awesome tool. Um, especially I love throwing streamers with it, swinging wet fly, but you could do it from the shore. If you guys two-handed cast a lot, it is a little easier in the water, even if you put or so, but yeah, it's a great tool, especially in high water. Okay. And then a couple other quick ones. What rod weight are you recommending? Nine foot five weight. Most of the time, if I'm streamer fishing a nine foot seven, and then if you're nymph fishing, you know, Typically, they're using longer rods, depending on if you're high sticking. You know, a 10 foot five or a 10 foot four, that's good. If you're looking for a do it all, everything, I'll tell you the 10 foot working in the fly shop for 20 years almost and going through it myself, getting a 10 foot rod for a do it all tool is a phase you will go through. A nine foot five weight or four weight is going to be much better. That's why, like, all saltwater rods are nine foot. The longer the rod is away from the cork, the less accurate it's going to be. So if I only had one rod, nine foot five weight. 
Okay. And then the next two, I think, are going to be related to the next section coming up, uh, but I'll say them anyway, just in case you want to work them in there. Uh, one was, you know, any nymphs, uh, and then another one was, um, will the Delaware River system see any cicadas from the upcoming hatch this spring? Not sure how far north the cicada hatch extends. So those are two bug-related questions, I think, to get us into the next section you're about to start. Yeah, what was the first part about the nymphs? I think one just, a person just typed in like any nymphs as if that was a question, because I think it, that question came up when you were talking mostly about the dries and then some streamers. So I think the question was any nymphs, um, but you may get into that here. So I, 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 unless the the, the yeah. uh, person wants to clarify that question, but I think it was just asking, you know, any nymphs, uh, do they use oh, yeah. uh, much nymphing? Sure, yeah. So I'm gonna go this next section here. Um, it covers all the bugs and obviously absolutely there are nymphs nymphing can be phenomenal um and we do not get cicadas and i'll go over those nymphs here in a minute okay great that's it for now i think we're ready for the next section thanks all righty so i'm just going to go through the bugs i'll try to cover a little ground and go quickly again these are the same bugs you'll see but some are more and less important for certain reasons to the delaware system um, some are almost useless, um, and it might surprise you, like a caddis. Me, my buddy, we always joke, around, like, we hate caddis. Those big fish don't eat them a lot, especially on the West Branch. I'll get into those details. But um, a lot of this stuff, again, it's to the whole Northeast, but a lot of little idiosyncrasies on how they pertain to our big wild fish. Um, again, so if we see bugs, it's, it's going to be warm, maybe towards 50 this weekend. Would not surprise me to see these guys, stoneflies. You got brown and black stoneflies. They're the earliest season bugs. I'm sure down in like central PA, they're starting to see them already. Really from February to mid-April, it's your go-to dry fly. Like I said, before April 15th, you could see some betas. So if all you had was this next fly I'm going to show you for these stoneflies, in a blue winged olive and say 18 through 22, you are covered for dry flies, I promise you. And I would probably stick with just this fly I'm gonna show you in a minute because I get, the fish have not been molested, they're hungry, and if they're up, I'm gonna get them to eat it. One thing, when you look at this picture and see a stonefly, as most of you probably know, but if you don't, stoneflies live in their nymphal stages on the bottom of the river for a season or two when conditions are right, they're gonna to migrate to an exposed rock or go towards the shore to hatch, unlike most mayflies or caddisflies. So this bug where its wings are, you know, stoneflies have two sets of wings, four sets total. That's why they're easy to differentiate from a caddis when they're flying, you can tell. But they never look like that picture. That picture was when I was steelhead fishing. It was a fly on my waders. You'll never, ever, ever see one in the water like that with its wings nice like that. You'll see a lot of fly patterns tied with like a piece of hackle pulled back. So it looks like this, but that's not how they're on the water. Just like a caddis fly, they're not going to ever come near, get on the water again unless it's windy and they get blown in there. A windy day is a great stone fly day. Just wait for the lulls and you'll probably see fish rising, but they're going to be fluttering. They're either laying their eggs or they got blown in. They don't want to be there. It means death. Um, so they're going to be fluttering. That's what you need. A simple elk hair caddis, a nice bushy wing. That's all you need because their wings are going to be fluttering or splayed out because they're dead. It's like um, an animal, you know, their wings get splayed out when they're dead and on the water. They're not going to be perfectly tended like that. So just a nice, simple caddis with a dark maroon body, dark brown body, or a black body, depending on the, the stone fly. Early season, it probably doesn't even matter. That's the only fly you need for the next couple months on top. Again, kind of, we, we've hit this a little bit. If we see any bugs now that are mayflies, they're going to be betas. Early season betas could be all winter. Um, this winter has been brutal. There have not been too many bugs this year, but if we do see some small little bugs popping up in the next couple months before mid-April. They're going to be betas. This is a typical CDC emerger. 
I tie all my own flies. So if anybody has any tying questions, you can type those in as well. One thing you'll notice through these flies, these are all shop flies we sell at the shop. We have a really good fly selection, um, but we, we fish very, very few, almost ironically, no Catskill style flies with like a fully palmered hackle. Um, everything's gonna be really flush in the water. You want stuff to be sparse. Um, we use a lot of emergers. As, as you can see, this is a CDC blue winged olive emerger tied on a scud hook. You can see the Zelon or Antron coming off the back. What you're replicating is a bug trapped in its nymphal shuck. Um, the, again, these fish are big and fat and smart, or those are the ones that we're targeting. And they just know they're not going to waste energy on a bug that's bouncing around and might fly away before they grab it. So a nice bug trapped in a shuck, that's an easy, vulnerable meal. Here is a CDC Comparadon. It's kind of hard to tell from that bottom view, but it's basically a Comparadon tied with CDC. And in the middle, it's got a little white CDC. Say this fly was a size 22 or 24, that white CDC in the middle really helps because I've got good eyes, but you know, you go past, cast past 30, 40 feet, um, it's very hard to see a small olive due to the color of it. It's not the size of it necessarily, it's more the color of it. But again, you'll see a common theme with all these flies, everything lies flush in the surface film. That's gonna help a lot, just your fly design. There's your betas nymph. Um, I honestly don't nymph a ton. I'm just kind of spoiled. I live up here, I try to focus. We'll just look for big fish feeding on top. But when I first moved here, or if I were only coming, I wasn't lucky enough to live here, I would nymph and do what I had to. As far as nymphs, pheasant tail nymphs are hard to beat. If I only had one nymph, it would be some type of pheasant tail. I tend to use more hackle in the thorax as your typical pheasant tail you would buy, maybe a little longer just to give it some movement. But I've looked at a lot of mayflies under a microscope, and it, it's always funny to me. You get... Um, mayfly like a, a blue winged olive nymph that's green or olive and maybe so you know they're all pheasant tail colored blue winged olive nymphs are not green um that's just something to kind of sell you so you had one nymph pheasant tails are hard to beat on that same note if you're tying like to tie because you don't see them for sale a lot but i tie all mine on some type of scud hook like a curved shank hook because you know, nymphs aren't mobile insects. Um, they live most of their life, all of their life, other than a few seconds in the emergence phase on the bottom. They're not swimming around and doing stuff, even an Isonychia swimmer nymph. They might migrate a little bit, a few feet, get knocked off in a rainstorm or something, but they're on the bottom hugging the rocks. But when they're coming up through the water column, they're gonna get an air bubble in their carapace or wing case which is that dark portion where the wings pop out from, they get an air bubble in there and migrate to the top, but they're always crunched up. So hence, that's why you use a scud hook. So a pheasant tail on a scud hook or a 2302, any curved shank hook is gonna be advantageous. Early season olives, you wanna go with a rusty spinner. Again, just a nice small rusty. I love spinners. This is one of my favorite slides out of here. If I only had one fly, the rest of my life on the Delaware for dry fly fishing or any fish or any river where fish eat flies, especially selective fish, um, a rusty spinner. One thing to remember about the spinners, you got two colors. So if you tie in size 10 through 20, you got on your left, a ginger colored spinner that's tied with a quill, a strip quill, which you can dye pre-dyed, on your right, you got the same fly tied with a turkey by it. That's going to cover 99 point some odd percent of every single mayfly you're ever going to see. On our river system here, the only mayflies that aren't going to go into one of these groups are going to be a coffin fly, which is a green drake spinner, because it's a big white body. It looks like a Q-tip flying in the air. Trichos which have a white or clear abdomen and a dark thorax and a June paralep. 
which looks just like a trico, but it's a couple months earlier. Paralepsa blue quill, there are a version that hatch. And if you get guys saying they see trichos in late June, July, they're seeing June paralepsis. But again, Ginger and Rusty, 10 through 20 is going to cover every mayfly spinner other than those three bugs in the Northeast. Um, one thing too, you'll notice that these flies are tied grizzly hack. Typically, when fish are sipping on spinners, feeding like a sewing machine, it's going to be that last little bit of daylight. Um, and you're going to see them, you know, feeding like a sewing machine. But like a poly wing spinner that floats real high is going to work a lot worse than these. I promise you, if even if you did a real sparse poly wing spinner, it, it's just not going to ride as flush as this. I'll even add a lot of times, guys, they're hard to see, but so is a real spinner. A lot of the times, guys will want to put a little teeny CDC or poly wing post on there. I promise you, it will affect how that fly works. So what I'd recommend, if you can't see it, put it behind a bigger fly you can see. I'd much rather put it a foot behind, like you would tie a dropper, tie it a foot behind another fly, so you can see it. One other thing here you can see, because especially in the body, there's not a lot there. You don't have dubbing, so it's a, kind, a hard fly to get to float. Um, and you'll see in the back, I use a lot of micro fibbits. Um, those are the small tailing materials. The reason there's a half a dozen on each side there, you can dope it up with um, some gank or whatever your favorite floating is. Frogs fanny, it's going to hold that and help support that fly. It always cracks me up when you get, you see flies tied commercially or wherever, and they're tied with the correct number of tails. I promise you, if you find a fish that's counting tails, leave, you're probably not going to catch that fish. Go find another one. They just don't do it. So put a bunch on there, no matter what you're using, Conk de Leon, micro fibbits, and it's going to work well for you. Um, Quill Gordons, they're the first big bug we see kind of coincide with the parallel. You're looking at late April, early May. One thing, if you guys like swinging flies, this is kind of an anomaly in the mayfly world. Like I said, most mayflies get that nice bubble in their carapace. They're going to come up through the water column really slow. Epe oris, which is the uh, genus of uh, quill gordons, they actually hatch off the bottom like a caddis fly. So they're going to come up through the water column pretty quick as a winged insect, not as a nymph. You know, a nymph, or most nymphs, mayfly nymphs, come up slowly and emerge at the surface. So Epeoris come off the bottom. That's a lot of times why you'll see a violent splashy rise on these guys and a classic Quill Gordon wet fly or a couple of them, great way to swing up some fish. Again, there's your Quill Gordon Don, dark wing, looks very similar to a Hendrickson. Um, again, it's often mistaken for a Hendrickson, which has the three tails. Look for the two tails, an easy way to remember that. Quail Gordons are always going to come out calendar wise before the um, Hendrickson's. So you think two comes before three, Quail Gordons are going to have two tails versus three. There's your classic Quail Gordon fly. That's a cat scale fly. If I were going to fish that up here, up here, it'd be nice and heavy water. But if I were going to do it, I'd probably trim that um, hackle below where the hook point is almost to turn it into a comparadon. Your spinner, you're going to go rusty. One thing I forgot to touch when I talked about the ginger and rusty spinners, any light colored bug, think sulfur like Cahill, they're going to turn into a ginger colored spinner. Anything on the darker side, Isonychia, Quill Gordon, March Browns, they're going to turn into that rusty. Blue Quills Paralops, very, very prolific hatch. Usually second to third week of April, they're going to start showing up definitely by the third week of April, and they go well into May. Again, they'll eat these guys amongst a good Hendrickson hatch. It's a great fly. Those Hendrickson's and Paralops are always going to overlap each other. That's what, like early May, a number 16 rusty spinner could be a Paralops spinner. It could be uh, a uh, 
Hendrickson spinner. So again, one of my favorite flies. A mahogany don, again, these are just common names that you get mayflies that you tie, tied flies, you'll hear a mahogany don. That's referring to a, a parallel. And this is a great fly. Again, when you look at mayflies closely or look at them with a microscope, they have a lot of different colors. They're never a homogenous gray or brown, etc. So uh, for whatever reason, this dark claret color works very well for them. Again, that's a deer hair comparadon. Nice shock on there. It's going to ride flush and fish well. Again, your little uh, bait or uh, parallel nymph, uh, little 16 to 18. Uh, pheasant tail is going to be hard to beat. Spinner, dark mayfly, go rusty. Again, there's a grizzly hackled, nice turkey by it spinner. For you guys that tie, when I showed you the ginger versus rusty, I prefer turkey by it versus quills. Quills, you have to soak them for 10 or 15 minutes or they're going to crack when you tie them. Oftentimes, I'm getting ready to tie. You plan to tie a dozen. You've got them in the cup of water. They're soaking. The phone rings. You forget about them, or maybe you just don't want to tie anymore. They lose their color. Soaking them is a pain in the butt, whereas a turkey buy it, you don't need to do that soaking process. A lot of times, I'll dip it in water or just put it in my mouth. Um, it's not going to crack on you. They give you a beautiful segmented body and a, a pack of turkey bites is three or four bucks. You get two, two wing feathers and you got probably 400 mayflies. Great, great fly. You can use it for all mayfly bodies, not just spinners. Hendrickson's again, they're probably one of the most popular bugs up here, probably because it's early season. It's when a lot of guys focused on trout fishing size 14 to 16, sometimes early season, heavy water. You can get away with a size 12, um, you know, more material. It's going to float a little higher. Why not? Nice pinkish colored body. Again, this is a Renee Harrop fly commercially tied. It's got CDC. It's going to ride very flush in the water. Um, it's got a little bit of CDC pulled back for a wing. It's a good replication of an emerging mayfly. Hendrickson nymph, again, a nice clinger, a good pheasant tail and the appropriate size is going to work well. There's a shop tied Hendrickson nymph, a little fancy. It looks like it's got some, maybe some ostrich for the tail. I do like the hackle on that. Got a little epoxy on the wing case. It's going to work very well. This is a really good fly. You've probably seen it. Um, again, this is just a shop fly. It's going to cover multiple bugs, not just the Hendrickson. I use this a lot and tie it off as a dropper because past 40, 50 feet, it's very hard to see. Tie it 12, 15 inches behind a mayfly that you can see. Like say you get that last fly we had or a, a Hendrickson Comparadon with this behind it 15 inches, it's a deadly, deadly combo. Works very well. If ever you cannot see a fly, instead of adding more bulk to it, adding something that's bright, fish can see that. We won't go into how fish see the bubble around a fly. You're much better off, in my experience, tying it as uh, trailing. Some guys don't like to do it for ethics, et cetera. I understand that. But to me, just use that same sparse fly that works well, but use it behind a fly that, that you can see well. Again, there's your Hendrickson Don. Nice Don wing, probably a, a natural CDC or a, a Don snowshoe is going to work well for that. I tend to use a lot of snowshoe hair for wings. I like it more than CDC. It resists fish slime a little better. It doesn't get gummed up. You're going to want to go rusty with the spinner. Then once we get into the second, third week of May, we're going to start seeing March browns. Nice, big, robust clinger nymph size 10, 2X long to 14. They're really cool bugs. You're probably not going to be mistaken if you see a March brown nymph or a March brown dawn. Again, there's a nice specific March brown nymph, nice and thick. The mayfly, they're pretty variegated. You know, they're thick, stout bugs. You're going to notice them immediately when you see them. There's a snowshoe rabbit's foot um, a merger. Again, I use snowshoe a lot. A traditional pattern, if you're lucky enough to get some wood ducks, got a buddy that hunts wood ducks, an awesome, awesome material to lay over top, give it a little uh, 
variegation, a little bit break up that wing. It's going to model it a little bit, but that snowshoe is going to float very, very well. Hold up very well as, as well. Gray Fox, um, it's basically the same bugs. You know, there's not a lot of money in respeciating mayflies, but two or three years ago, they basically went through the process and said gray fox and March brown are the same species. Um, they tend to hatch a little bit later on our river. They're a little bit smaller, but again, same bug. Your rusty spinner, you could get away with a ginger spinner. A lot of times when a spinner first molts from a dun, so a dun flies into a tree, gets on some grass, sheds its exoskeleton like a snake. The next stage is the spinner. They're gonna start out lighter than when that exoskeleton hardens up. Same goes forth when, you know, and when they're in their nymphal stages and they, they grow, they're gonna shed their exoskeleton. And then the next stage is gonna be lighter until that exoskeleton hardens up a bit. Back in the day, I mean, we're talking 50, 60 years ago, they used to use a lot of really light nymphs, and it was for that very purpose. It's like a crawfish, like a soft crawl. They're really light until that new exoskeleton really hardens up. So sometimes you can get away with a little different colors. Light Cahills, we're kind of moving towards the summer, usually third week of May, early June. Um, nice bu bug. Probably, you know, the light Cahill is a common name. I always say there are more species of bugs we lump into the light Cahill category than any other genera of mayfly there is. A lot of different ones, we'll get them. We got summer stenos and uh, kind of summer Cahills. They're all in the stenonema family. They all kind of look very similar, but do differ a little bit. But there are a lot of different bugs that we lump into that Cahill category. There's just a nice thorax tie, kind of a cream body, little CDC thorax tie. Cahill nymph, again, a clinger. Uh, pheasant tail is going to work great for those. Your spinner, again, it's a light colored bug. You're going to want to go with a ginger spinner. There you go. That's going to be perfect for those. Green drakes, now we're getting into around Memorial Day, late May, early June. Um, it's a big bug. Again, it's going to be one that's unmistakable other than a hexagenia, which we don't see much here. These are going to be the biggest mayflies you see. The West Branch itself is pretty poor for green drakes or brown drakes in general. There's just not a good muddy substrate for them. Down, if you've ever fished here, down below a resort, there's a boat ramp called Balls Eddy. Right above Balls Eddy, there's an area called the Mud Flats. So you get a lot hatching out of there, a decent number. So from there, you know, mayflies always fly upstream before they deposit their eggs. If not, they all would have been in the ocean a million years ago. So upstream from the mud flat, say up to the tail end of our resort, that's where you start to, or about where you'll see these guys, the main stem and east branch, much better substrate for them. Nice big green drake comparadon. There's your coffin fly. That's one a ginger rusty will not work on. Um, again, they look like if you look up in the air and it looks like a bunch of Q-tips flying around, you probably want to wait it out because it's probably going to be a great night. You get a lot of big fish that might not otherwise eat mayflies that will come up for these bugs. That's a big coffin fly. Brown drakes, very similar substrate and like where I just talked about, we don't get any on the west, very few. East branch, main stem, they need that mud to burrow in. One thing for you guys, Nymphon, as we're moving into the summer, kind of summer weather patterns, you're going to start to get a lull. You don't have like Hendrickson's blue quills, March browns. You're going to have some great fishy midday. Um, once we get into summer, you know, weather's in the 70s to 80s. There's probably going to be a lull. It's a good time to nymph midday. Um, it's hard to see on here because its gills are straight up like this as the picture is being taken because there's water in the Petri dish there. But definitely want to, especially if you tie, put some marabou or some aftershaft fibers in there. The pulsation of that is going to really key in. Those fish are going to key in on it because those gills move around as that bug's breathing. Um, for your brown drakes, you're going to want to go with a nice big rusty spinner. 
this is kind of an obscure bug, a cornuda. Um, usually happens mid-June to July. They're typically in faster water. If you see something that looks like a blue-winged olive that's in the 14 to 16 range, that's why it can be tricky because a lot of times you don't have anything that will mimic that bug because it's a size 14 to 16 olive. You know, most of your olives start at size 18 and get smaller. So if you do see something that big in the body, it's kind of hard to tell from this photo, but the body's got more a brighter green to it than a typical betus. But again, the fast water will hold them. It can be a good hatch up here, and it, it's good to have a few bigger olives in your arsenal. Again, that same betus type mayfly, just in a size 14 or so, will work well. For your spinners, just like all olives, you want to go rusty. Now we get into the sulfurs. Like I said, this is really the most prolific hatch you'll probably see in the Northeast period, other than maybe a green drake hatch on, you know, down in State College or something. But these last for probably two months. You're looking at late May, early June, and stuff starts to get pretty tough as far as the fishy. You'll be surrounded. I'm not lying to you when it can be frustrating because you'll be surrounded by big fish which are visibly over 18 to 20 inches all day long in the midday, they get brazen. A fish that you couldn't get within 40, 50 feet from the past two months, they're starting to get used to fishermen. This, the rivers up here get pretty crowded, especially by then. And they'll, they'll swim five feet away from you and pick these duns off the water and it can be maddening. There's a few things I'll, I'll mention that will help you out. The first phase of the sulfurs are the rotundas and the invarias. They're 14 to 16. A lot of times on the main stem, we'll see those in late May, early June. Down on the main stem in East Branch, especially the lower east, you don't get that prolific Dorothea hatch. That's up in the upper west. And then the Dorotheas, the later phases, 18 to 20, late June, July, and most of August. Here's an unweighted sulfur nymph. This is just a shop fly. That same fly tied on a scud hook as a pheasant tail is going to work very well. One thing is soon, the reason that they're difficult, every mayfly emerges a little differently. The sulfurs don't get a real good air bubble in their wing case. And that process of them coming up, breaking out of their nymphal skeleton into a wing mayfly is a lot slower than other bugs. So what happens, and if you're paying attention, you'll be able to see this, a lot of your fish immediately start feeding right below the surface. So you have somebody that's been fishing up here the last two months, then the sulfurs start hatching and they have a lot of difficulty. They think they're seeing rising fish, but a lot of times you'll see body parts, you'll see peck fins, adipose fins. That's because the water columns here the fish is feeding like this and you'll see a back or a tail as he's feeding six, eight inches a foot under the surface. So an unweighted nymph fished as a dropper is almost essential during that time period. There's a nice sulfur nymph, a very simple copper bead, pheasant tail. That's a deadly sulfur nymph, especially right before the sulfur hatch. There's a nice sulfur comparadon. This is when tying and being creative and having 10 or 15 patterns for one species of bug really comes in. That's a nice little bug. I really like the dual body color of that fly. Again, I tie all my own flies. Almost all of my mayfly emergers are gonna have that two-toned clink hammer style body, dark in the back, light in the front. It's just really accentuating that bug being trapped in his nymphal shuck which makes those fish prey up on that bug. They'll pass up 57 healthy duns and pick some weird bug off the surface because the wing's broken, bugs in his nymphal shuck, et cetera. But you want something that just makes that bug look vulnerable. Cripples work well. Quigley cripple is an awesome fly. As far as your uh, sulfur spinners, go ginger. Um, because that hatch is so prolific, a lot of times, Fish will actually eat gobs of sulfurs like they do trichos out west. So 
when in doubt, if you know there are a million sulfur spinners on the water, a lot of times you're fishing, you think you got a good drift over them and you probably did, but it's just a numbers game. You're amongst thousands of others. Keep putting that fly over there. Eventually that fish will make a mistake. Isonychia, now we're into mid-June is usually when they start. It's a, this is a very, um, very productive bug especially for blind casting. There are several broods, but again, mid-June through October, if you're out fishing all day, you're going to see Isonychia. This is one of the only swimmer nymphs that we have. So the body's very long and slender compared to most, like a clinger style mayfly, which is nice and squat. Red wing coachman is an awesome fly to swing. Again, we're getting into June, July, August. You're going to have a lot of dead time midday. So swinging some flies, I love doing it. I kind of prefer it to nymph fishing if I can get away with it. Um, tie on a couple lead wing coachmans and go for some riffles, and uh, you'll probably be rewarded there. There's a nice ISO nymph. They're great blind casting flies. What I mean by blind casting, that means you're not targeting a specific fish. You're gritting the water, especially out of a boat. You're just kind of gritting, moving water, have faith, get good drifts. Once you lose that drift and it starts to drag, regroup, put it out there. If you grid water with an ISO, June through October, you will catch fish. Probably that time period, midday, if guys are dry fly fishing, moving in a boat, that's what they're doing is blind casting an ISO. Nice ISO parachute works well. Um, you can run a dropper off of it if you need. Great fly. You want to go rusty for those. I'll stop for a minute. I know we've taken a while. Um, I, I'll kind of move through this second part quickly. We're just, again, this stuff becomes a little subjective, just leaders tip it, et cetera. But any questions that you guys had before I move on to this? Yeah, um, Ben, there were a couple that came in. Uh, I think this goes back to um, when we were asking about the float versus wade, another person ended, uh, chatted in, any section of the West Branch a problem for one-man inflatable boats? No, it's a very mild river um, under normal water flows. I probably wouldn't do an inflatable over, over 1,500 CFS. You're going to want to know what you're doing and be careful. 2,000 probably becomes dangerous, but it's a, as far as like rapids and dangerous, uh, it's a very, very mild river. So no. Okay. And then a bug related question or a fly related question. It says, how many flies allowed at one time on the West Branch? No, no limit. Okay. That's all for now. Yeah. All righty. So again, I'll, apologize for if I took too long, but try to move through this fairly quickly there. And again, a lot of this stuff, it might contradict what you've done for years or decades. But again, it's stuff that I've used over the years. All my buddies are guides. Um, a lot of them are guiding 130 days a year. And this is just stuff that does work for us. Flies that work, just trust what works and keep it simple. Um, the longer you do it, and again, it's just a learning experience, but having a lot of flies is advantageous, especially like a lot of good sulfur patterns, but you find something that works, keep it simple. If a Quigley Cripple works and a Snowshoe Emerger, you can tie every single pattern that way. This is just a streamer box. I use a lot of clousers and deceivers and just change the weight on them. This is a nice streamer that has no weight to it. It's a, basically a deceiver, but I didn't mention sometimes when the reservoir spills, we get alewives in the river and you got fish that are used to, they're used to the ecosystem. You get tens of thousands of discombobulated alewives coming over the dam. It's like a striper blitz. It's pretty awesome fishing. It doesn't happen all the time, but um, it's awesome when it happens. But again, this is just a deceiver with a fish skull, change up your weights. Pretty much all my streamer fishing, I'm using clousers and deceivers, only modifying the weight there. Again, uh, keep it real, avoid bulk, especially with streamers or dry flies. 
bulky is usually not good. It's not a high gradient stream. Um, flotation of the fly is important, but it's not going to get drowned in some rapids. But even with a streamer, again, this is going to work real well. I, one thing I use on my streamers, clousers, deceivers, you can see right behind the head, you can see that red. Every single streamer I tie, I incorporate that. So when you're sandwiching your deer hair, this fly actually has like some Arctic fox, fin raccoon, just some odd materials that are more steelhead, uh, used for steelhead flies. But I'll put basically after shaft fiber. So you have like a ch Chinese hen hackle or something just a subpar hackle that's red down at the bottom you have the real webby hackle what i'll do i'll strip all the good hackle off tie it in down there where that webby stuff is make a couple revolutions around there and you get that after shaft fiber that really pulsates and moves and you don't see that on a traditional clouser but it works very well i know a lot of the young guys and kids and not just them but it's all the rage to use these big articulated streamers. I can promise you a good deceiver or clouser will outfish those 10 or 15 to one every single day of the week for a dragon tail. You'll get fish bumping them and messing with them. Whereas they're going to inhale something like this. A lot of times keep it small, keep it the size of your pointer finger. It does not have to be big. There's a time and a place for it, but they see a lot of, especially you get high water, rivers blown out, everybody's throwing streamers. Keep those flies sparse. There's another one with no weight at all. One thing I always do as well, when you're tying a streamer, I, I don't like using like, even a woolly bugger is a good example. It's a great fly, but it's just a homogenous ball of material. Every single fish you'll ever see, most amphibian, anything, it's gonna be dark on the top, light on the bottom. Remember that when you're tying flies. So I'll use a darker, darker color um, bucktail or fin raccoon up top. I like peacock hurl, like a classic deceiver, you guys striper fish or anything. Those are great flies, but all fish that you'll ever see are dark on top, light on the bottom. There's another one, you know, vary your weights. But once that thing gets wet, it looks very, very real. Get into tippet options. There are a lot of different um, types of tippet out there now. A lot of it, some of it's kind of BS. Um, one thing, all these brands are good. I like Orvis stuff. Rio works well. The Trout Hunter works really well. I tend to use that a lot. The half, like the 0.5 X sizes might seem a little gimmicky, but you know, you're down to 6X. You know, seven tenths of a pound could be the difference between landing a fish and breaking it. It's good stuff. All this stuff is good. And I tend to use fluorocarbon for everything. Five and six X most of the time. We're talking dry fly fishing. Five and six X. I'll start out the year with five X and then migrate to six X. Theoretically, water's getting lower. Bugs are getting smaller fish are getting spookier. So you need that smaller, especially with a small bug. When I go below, probably a six, when I get to 16 or below, I use six X because you don't have the rigidity of the four or five X. So it's going to get a better drift because it's so small. It doesn't have the buoyancy and the mass to get a good drift with some of those stiffer tippets. Um, again, like I said, one of the biggest things I see, one of the biggest mistakes and you could be the best fisherman in the world, but if you're using a seven and a half foot leader, it's gonna be really hard to be successful on top. If you only could buy one leader, a nine foot four X is awesome. You can build off of it. That's what I typically recommend. A lot of these longer leaders like that Trout Hunter 10 foot four X, awesome leader. I like the formula that 12 foot five X is nice. But a nine foot four X is really hard to beat because what I'll do, start out with a nine foot four X nylon leader. I always use nylon leaders with fluorocarbon tippet because um, I'm using several feet of tippet, even with streamers. So they're not even gonna see that leader portion. The fluorocarbon to me is a waste of money, but I'll go with that nine foot four X start the year. I'll add two feet of five X, two to three foot of five X. As the year goes on, Bugs get smaller, water's lower, clear, et cetera. I'll add six to that leader that I'd already built with the 5X. 
So before I had nine foot four X with three foot of five. So that was 12 foot. Now I'll add another two foot of six X on there. Now I got a 14, 15 foot leader. So if you're only to buy one, nine foot four X is hard to beat. There's your good nylon choices. Again, I like all those good fluorocarbon choices. And again, I use fluoro for everything. These are just some numbers and numbers don't lie. Again, it's subjective, but most of you probably know this. Every single thing, glass, water, et cetera, has a refractive index. These are refractive, refractive indices of different materials. So water is gonna refract light at 1.330. Fluorocarbons 1.42 or roughly depends on who super greater than water, it's going to refract 6% more light, be more visible. Nylons 1.5 or 1.62, so it's almost 18% more than water. Long story short, nylon is more visible. Almost every presentation I do, someone will say, and they're probably typing it now, you can't, you, you know, it's only good for nymphing. You can't use it for dry fly fishing. I've talked to guys that are, that guys that you know that are super famous in the, as famous as you get in the fly fishing world. And they had trouble and they're talking about, and I mentioned it and they even said, you can only use fluoro for nymphing. All, everybody that is up here a lot is going to probably use the fluoro. Do you have to? No, but they say that it sinks, which is true. That's a, an advantage. Say it's low water, you're fishing in a foot of water, gin clear water, small bugs. I want that tippet to break the surface film where it's gonna be nearly invisible versus coiling on top and floating on top of the water surface in that situation. So I tend to use fluoro for everything you spend. Again, it's more expensive, I understand that. You spend so much money on everything, rods and reels and boats and guides and gas. Um, for the only thing that might make a difference and the only thing that's tying your fly to your fly line, I'd stick with the fluorocarbon. It's a little denser, more abrasion resistant. One of the uh, things you'll hear people say that it's, it's uh, you know, the degradability of it. It doesn't degrade as fast. The thing is, every piece of nylon line ever made that your grandpa used is still on this earth and will be for a couple hundred years. So you gotta be responsible with it all. But at the end of the day, I do prefer fluorocarbon for everything because it's less visible and it does sink like that. Again, fly lines, you're not, I'm not gonna teach you a lot here, but even working in the shop, there are so many different fly lines now, it can be overwhelming. Especially the rod technology now is unbelievable. We have better, obviously better rods than have ever been made, but I talk to a lot of my buddies and even industry guys, sales reps, et cetera, but it seems like the more technically advanced these rods are, the more susceptible they are to the right line choice. A lot of them are $130, as you can see. That's a ton of money to buy a line that's not going to work with your rod. And that $130 line will cast like crap on certain rods. So again, give us a call. We, we play with all these. We try to have all the new lines on a reel in our shop so you can take them out and use them take them out and take advantage of that before you drop 100 or 130 bucks and cast two or three of them one is going to be a sweetheart on your rod and a lot of them are going to be subpar you know now a lot of them are half a line size heavy um some are lighter some are just normal but again talk to somebody that knows i'd be happy to help you out you tell me your rod in five seconds, I can tell you the best line for it. Um, better yet, come and cast it. Same that goes for rods. We'll let you all the time, guys will bring in a stack of paper this big. They printed up the Yellowstone rod shootout. That's awesome. It's decent info. He's trying to sell you something. Come in and we'll, I'll give you three rods to take out and fish for the day. If you're dropping 400 or 500 or a thousand bucks, you might as well take them out and fish them because at the end of the day, you're the one using it. That's the only way you can really tell. One other thing on lines, those scientific angler amplitude lines in the Orvis Pro line on the bottom left are essentially the same line. Your tapers can be different, but uh, Orvis owns scientific angler. The one thing with the amplitude in the, in the past, all fly lines, the 
slickness coating is a topical finish, almost like a DWR in a raincoat. Um, with these, it's actually built into the sheath of the line. And when you clean it and generate some friction on there, it's a heat loving substance and it migrates to the exterior of the line. They're really good, highly durable. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. And again, um, tapers are everything. Try it on your individual setup. Uh, again, streamer fish in lower water, something like a hydros bank shot, something like that, a shooting head type line. They're going to really shoot line better for streamer fish. And it's like almost like a, a sink tip. You've got all that weight up front in the short head. So if you're throwing a mouse or throwing a streamer in water that's not that deep, that's going to save you thousands of false casts for a day. That's just a shooting head type line. But again, there's lines that are better for beginners, etc. These are good lines for softer rods, bamboo rods, graphite rods. We sell a lot of the wolf triangle taper. They're really good lines. These are the shooting head type lines I told you about. So it's one false cast and you can launch it streamer some they're not dry fly lines they're for something pretty wind resistant i use them for anything under a thousand cfs if you're talking streamer fishing and you want to get deep um this is your cheapest option a poly leader we sell several different types you got intermediate different ways you know rather than buying a hundred dollar sink tip you're only going to use once you just girth hitch these they're loop to loop you can go from there and take them off when you're done there I tend to use on the left there, you got a 24 foot sink tip. It's gonna dig more. It's not gonna plane as the line swings. It's gonna get down, but it's gonna be much harder to cast if you not, have not cast that before. That shorter one on the right, something in the five to 10 foot range for the sink tip is gonna be good. And anything over a thousand CFS or so, I'll start to run a sink tip and then always modify for the situation with the weight of your fly. Floatants, they all have their place. Um, again, nothing new here, but starting from the right, a quell, that's like a gank, great, great fly uh, floating. It works well, but you can't use it on CDC. The one to the left, that Loon Loxa, it's great because it will work on CDC flies. It doesn't mat down the barbules. And then you've got a couple powder treatments. I would not fish without a good liquid floating, which is usually that Loxa and then a powdered floating. Because what happens, once your fly gets wet, say you caught some fish, it's your favorite fly, it's been working, you don't wanna get rid of it because it doesn't float well. So you're gonna to wanna to use a desiccant. I like something with the brush, frogs fanny, loon dust, every company makes it now. The reason is why, say I'm putting it on one of those flies with a scud hook and your wings up here. If I put it in that powder dip and shake it, that whole fly, including the lower half of the body, is going to float on top on its side. It's not going to stay underneath the water column half and half like a, a fly should. So what I'll do with the brush, I'll only hit the wing and the thorax, not that shuck hanging down into the water. So I really prefer the brush on these guys. Um, sole options. It's a pretty mild river, but I would recommend some type of stud. When I first moved up here, I was worried that the fish could hear the studs and you were putting fish down. Then I realized falling in the river makes more noise than any amount of studs. So go with some type of stud. The aluminum bars, if your boots will accept them, are really nice. Really the aluminum or aluminum cleats like Sims makes, it's just a better option. It's malleable. It grips, grips the different surfaces better. Um, felt is used here. You got to watch out for the Diddy Mo, but felt compared to Vibram or rubber grips better. And then you can put studs in either one. There's a couple stud options, but it's probably a good move to do that. One thing on nets, I'm not trying to teach you something about nets or sell you one. We do have a lot of nice ones to choose from. But all the time I see guys come up, they're fishing the Delaware the first time, and they got a net about this big, as big as my head. I promise you, if you hook a fish of a lifetime, a 25 inch brown, whatever it may be, on 6X tippet, and you're struggling to get it in and net it, and it's pissed off, and you have a net this big, it's not going to end well. So get something, no matter what it is, with a nice, big, deep hoop so you can net that fish. 
A lot of different options. One more, I'm almost done here. One thing, especially in the summer, always bring a rain shell. It's probably one of the most important pieces of gear. It makes a good windbreaker. A lot of times you're fishing in the summer, you know, that water is 45, 48 degrees. Sun goes down, you've been out in the sun, just something to block the wind. You get a small rainstorm, always have a good rain shell. Um, that's pretty much it. This is just our contact info. Again, I'm there pretty much every day if you need anything. Um, if I'm not, leave a message. I'll get back to you within a day or so. But there's our number. I think I've got, and if you're in the area, we've got a great bar and restaurant, really the best in the area. This was a few years ago. We've actually been there 30 years now. But um, this has, so the top web address, westbranchresort.com. look at cabins get info on that um i do a fishing report on there every day once stuff starts getting a little better and then down at the bottom westbranchangler.com is our online store and then there's our phone number and that's pretty much it i thank all you guys and then any questions i'll be happy to answer well ben first of all thank you very very much this has been a, a phenomenal program um and we do we are we did get a few more uh, that came in while you were talking. And then, of course, we'll hang out to see if any more are going to get typed in. Uh, let's see. One was, is there any day or uh, date or time when the streamers work better? That one was a little bit earlier, I think, when you just started this last section. Is any date or time better when streamers work? They can work year round. Um, like if I were fishing now coming up, we got some high water. You'd want to fish them low and slow. How you fish them changes, but um, they would work anytime. Big fish are always eating other fish. It's a great, especially if you want to focus on bigger fish, it's, it's a great option. One thing I would say, especially as we get later in the season, think summertime, think even May, when you can see 30 drift boats going down the river. If you're an early riser, in the morning from say 20 minutes before sunset, you don't have to get out in the total darkness. I've done it a lot and usually your bite happens a little closer to sunset. But from a half hour before sunrise till say 7.30, 7.30 or eight in the morning, even in the dead of summer, low water, that is, prob that is the best time to streamer fish. Other than turbid high water, that is a deadly time to streamer fish. You could catch more fish in an hour and a half in those hours than you could all day doing anything else. Really? Um, <laughs> that is good to know. I'm making a note of that. Yes. Um, and then there was another question about lead or non-lead. That was a little bit earlier, not this last part when you were going over the line. So, uh, but I think it was obviously referring to line. So lead or non-lead? Yeah, so obviously in New York State, you cannot sell it but you can use it. So you can use it. Um, I tend to like lead, to be honest with you. It's uh, the tin stuff's a little harder to put on there, but lead um, stays on well, easy to crimp on. You got the environmental factor. You can buy it in Pennsylvania, say, you can buy it off of eBay. You can pretty much buy it online. As long as the company's not selling it in New York, you're good to go, but it is legal to use it. And I think that is it on the questions, although we, have, we do have one person that said they, they plan to be there Memorial Day weekend. So, um, but right now, yeah, there are no more questions coming in in the chat. And I know what he, we said earlier, if people want to unmute themselves uh, and maybe throw up their Zoom hand and I can call on, on anybody. But I think a lot of times the, the chat uh, function is working well because people could just put the question in when it comes to them. Uh, but if you want, we can give it another minute or so and see if any more come in. Uh, and then I will uh, pass it on back to Joe Morgan. And again, Ben, thank you very much for the presentation. Yeah, thank you guys for sitting through it. I appreciate it. Oh, we do have one coming in. It says, what, uh, what, like, what length leader for streamer fishing? I think you actually mentioned something like this before, which was trimming an old beat, uh, beat up uh, leader. Um, but I'll let you kind of answer that question. What length leader would you have for streamer fishing? Yeah, um, typically under five foot. 
it may seem a little short and I've talked about how fussy the fish are. You probably heard how fussy they are when you're subsurface, especially in the summertime, I tend to strip pretty fast. Um, you could not strip a fly too fast for that fish to catch it. I promise you that, but keep it short. Um, like he said, I tend to use your cheapest option instead of discarding your old leaders, cut them back to about three foot and then tie, you know, say two foot of 10 pound tippet on there. A lot of times I don't even use like an X size tippet. I'll use um, more like a leader material, something that's a little more abrasion resistant. I know a lot of guys steelhead use it. Maybe you go and buy the same stuff you throw on a spinning rod, like some cigar fluorocarbon or something, and just straight 10 pound test, Berkeley vanish, et cetera. That's typically what I use for streamers because the diameter is not super important, but you want something that's abrasion resistant because the way they hit that, you're talking about big fish, you're dragging on rocks, you're hooking stuff under the surface. So you're going to lose less flies and land more fish and you can get away with it. And I have a follow-up question to that. So is that um, not just a um, strength thing, but is, is, is also trimming that length to make it more manageable when trying to cast that streamer out there? Is it, is it both those things? A hundred percent. Like if you tried to cast one of those flies I showed you, which is far from a big articulated um, what a zoo cougar or any fly that you could think of casting it on a nine foot leader is going to be disastrous yeah just going to be super hard okay yeah um that looks like it for now i've got no more that uh have come in since that one so we we may be done with regards to the questions uh so uh joe i don't know if you want to if you want to pick it up from here Yes, yes. I just want to thank you, Ben. Um, excellent presentation, um, which I knew it would be. And um, appreciate for, for taking your time out on this evening to come and talk to us and uh, really gets me excited for this upcoming season. Um, with that, Bill, again, thanks for running the show. Appreciate it. And um, everyone that's still on the line, thanks for uh, for joining us and stay well. And, and we hope to see you next month. Same time, same bat channel, I guess. <laughs> yes, again, we thank you very much. For, yeah. <laughs> so everyone have yep. a good evening and I guess we'll close the meeting. Yep, I will hit the end button right now again. Thank you, Ben, and thank you all for attending. So Thanks, have guys. A, a great night, everybody. Thanks, Ben, and everybody. Bye -bye. You too. Thanks, guys. All right, you too. so long. Uh,